Good day and welcome to Westchester Talk Radio, westchestertalkradio.com. I'm John Marino and we are produced by Shark Creative. That is Shark with a C, not a K. You see the Shark logo behind me in orange and blue on the wall behind me here. And we are made possible by people like our good friends over at Entergy Indian Point Energy Center. At Indian Point Energy Center, they promise to keep powering up our communities and supporting our communities right through April of 2021. Also buy Lipolis Electric at Lipolis. Don't be left in the dark. Get Lipolis. And buy Hightower Westchester, managing your wealth to a fiduciary standard. Welcome to the Cup of Joe political show. We are joined by the supervisor of the town of Austin, Dana Levenberg. Dana Levenberg, thank you for joining us here, first of all, on Westchester Talk Radio. And secondly, Ossining is the oldest incorporated village in the county of Westchester. The name Ossining comes from old and Native American for stone upon stone or stony place, which I guess you kind of have right across the river in Stony Point in Rockland. Maybe Stony Point and Ossining were at one time conjoined. And the Hudson River was formed and split you guys up, right? I guess so. That sounds like a, that definitely sounds like a theory. <laughs> yeah, geography um, as a kid, so I, it made I, me I, think of that once I came across the meaning of Austin. Okay, all Alabama. right, well. Now, you have a various background uh, before you became the supervisor of Austin. You've worked for a variety of people, for example, Sandy Galef and Catherine Borgia, well-known around the county. Sandy as an assemblywoman, and Catherine, one of the leaders of the Westchester County Board, and other things you've done along the way. Okay, uh, well, thanks so much for that introduction. I just want to clarify. I, I worked with Catherine Borgia, but I did not actually work for her. She uh-huh. was working in um, Assemblywoman Galef's office when I started, and uh, she was the chief of staff and I was communication director. And then she ran for town supervisor in the town of Austin. And when she ran for town supervisor, I actually was promoted to um, Sandy's chief of staff and uh, ran her uh, Austin, her local, her local office and that out of Austin. So I've worked with her actually for many years and I have to give her credit as a mentor. Um, I met her over a PT table of $25,000 in small change that we collected for a uh, gift wrap fundraiser for the Austin um, park school PTA way back, way back when. And, um, that's how, that's how we met. And she has always, um, given me a lot of support in, pursuing my next, my next interesting move. Um, and she's been a mentor and a friend for many years. So, um, I, I certainly have, uh, followed to a certain degree in her footsteps as I went from working for Sandy to running for town supervisor. Um, I did learn so much from Sandy Galef. Also, um, she has been an incredible teacher, also mentor and friend, and um, gave me an opportunity to really get involved in some uh, statewide initiatives, including the um, Mid-Hudson Region Economic Development uh, Council, which is how I learned about so many grant opportunities that we have actually applied for here in the town of Austin. And also, uh, I got more involved in environmental issues. And I learned actually a good deal about organ donor involvement and some of the issues that we have here in the state of of New York. And I might mention that a little bit too. Um, But I'm very interested in uh, making our world sustainable and making sure that we can do that in a way that um, makes the Hudson Valley region. Now, through your years around Ossining, and let's keep in mind that the town of Ossining is composed of the village of Ossining and part of Briarcliff Manor, too. What have you learned about the differences between okay. both communities, the Ossining side and the Briarcliff Manor side? Is there much of a difference or are there different issues there that you have to navigate as the town supervisor? Good question. Uh, well, I think, you know, they are definitely different communities. There's no doubt that uh, the village of Briarcliff is more homogenous um, and certainly scales a bit wealthier. Um, then we have in between the unincorporated town of Ossining, which is the part that I'm also the local elected official for because they don't have a mayor. They have a supervisor and I act as their mayor. Um, my internet connection is unstable, so I'm hoping that this is going to 
continue to work. Um, and then we have the village of Austin, which is obviously the biggest of all of the entities that form up the, the town general. And uh, it is a diverse and vibrant uh, community where there are um, a different, there's certainly different sets of issues. I mean, as we're looking right now at police reinvention and reform, I think that um, we're hearing different differently from both of these communities, the village of Briarcliff Manor and the village of Austin, um, as to where the priorities should be. Um, I would, I would, I would venture to say that there are tend to be a lot of quality of life issues that we see in unincorporated town of Austin and the village of Austin police department or the Austin police department serves us now as um, our local police department. We, we contract with them for police services. We do not have our own police department right now. Um, it was the West uh, Westchester County police actually when the police in town of Austin dissolved the Westchester County police first and then we went out to bid. This was before I became supervisor and Village of Boston won the bid and now we've been working with them um, and we're in their, our second contract. Is it difficult so to bring all these different sides of the community together or is it something that when you get into office and you gain trust that it becomes that much easier among your constituents? Well, I certainly think that trust is the biggest um, factor and we do everything we can in Austin to earn the trust of our taxpayers, our residents um, and the general community, our businesses as well. And, you know, working during this um, pandemic has been a trying time, but certainly it's a time when we've had to figure out different ways to, to connect with our public and to earn their trust and to, and to make sure that we're in constant communication so that we can share information with them, whether from the state or from the county, um, and uh, what resources are available. And then we also work with our local partners in many not-for-profits, as well as the Village of Austin as well as the village of Briarcliff Manor. And yes, by working good. together in partnership with these governments, I think we have a, a better opportunity to earn, to earn the trust of everybody. Since the pandemic hit, have you had to reinvent government or just adjust slightly? Uh, I think a little bit of both. I think that we have had to find um, way, unique ways and hope maybe even better ways that can last into long term. You know, we like to look for the silver linings of um, making sure that we reach people and that we're able to continue to do the business of government. Um, one of our you know, key offices here is on the ground floor of our village and town hall is our town clerk, um, Sue Donnelly, who actually preceded me in the role of town supervisor. She's now um, our elected town clerk. She also serves as village clerk. And, you know, people come in for death certificates, for marriage licenses, uh, for hunting licenses, fishing licenses, um, all sorts of different, um, and just to look up records. And uh, so much of what they do, they come in person to do. So a lot of, um, I give uh, our, our clerk, clerk Donnelly a lot of credit for sort of move very quickly to find ways to do more online. And, uh, you know, a lot of done here was a little fashion for a period of time, uh, but she sort of saw an, an opportunity in this pandemic to make it easier for people to connect online. And uh, we've recently um, brought on seamless docs so that we, are able to uh, offer a lot of those services now online to people that they can do from the comfort of their own home. I think also just engaging with the public and public meetings has been a challenge, but also an opportunity because I from their home in, in government, if they can just flip a switch and they're in the room then with uh, their government leaders. So we have seen changes in that. And then obviously, you know, we have a senior nutrition program, which is, you know, really critical to our seniors who come in daily to socialize, to um, break bread with each other, uh, play bingo, do some chair yoga, dancing, draw, et cetera. Um, and we had to roll all those programs back because they just weren't safe. Just now we're starting to bring them back online without the food, because we really think that um, it's critical that we keep our seniors 
as safe as possible. And we think that when you eat, you have to take your mask off. And when you're inside, that's just not a good idea. So we've been bringing our seniors in in small groups just to talk, just to socialize. Then we send them home with a meal. And throughout this time, we've actually been feeding our seniors by making sure there's. Go ahead. Sorry, John. Yeah. Can we say that we've never enjoyed working from home so much? Based upon everything that's gone on, something that we've learned along the way? It all depends how many people are working from home. I don't know how many people are working from your home. But, uh, yeah, I think, you know, it, it was great at the beginning, but it got old. It got old fast, I think. We've all been back here in uh, town hall frequently, many of us. There's still We are still staggering in certain departments that are um, having – just an ability to be able to get the business of the town done just as easily from home as they can from here so that we can have fewer people inside together in those indoor spaces um, makes it a little easier for people to work if they have their own space that they may be able to take their mask off. But we like to see everybody wearing their masks during the day when they're in shared spaces because we know, still know that science is telling us that that's just the safest way to be when you're in, indoors. Now, you discussed the effect of COVID socially around the town of Austin and the effect on that angle of life. How about from a health standpoint, how difficult has the COVID-19 pandemic been to deal with? Uh, It's been challenging. You know, we also have um, Austin Volunteer Ambulance Corps serves the Mid-Hudson Ambulance District, which Austin Town is a part of, as well as the village, as well as parts of Newcastle. And um, they also serve service Sleepy Hollow and Croton a little bit. Um, and, you know, having OVAC here has actually been a tremendous asset, um, as well as, uh, you know, we have seen sort of firsthand how many calls they had to go on and how difficult it was to make sure they maintained their staff at full capacity. Uh, Volunteers, many of whom are volunteers, you know, it was a time that was scary. But of course, you know, as volunteers who put themselves out as first responders often do, including our our Austin uh, Volunteer Fire Department, um, they really stepped up and um, they made sure that they had the personal protective equipment. They got right on looking for um, a product that could was effectively sanitizing the ambulance. And they started, you know, at the beginning, we were daily kind of sending out to them, and we're back to doing that a little bit, um, sending out the addresses of homes where we were seeing um, COVID. So they knew that if they had a report to those homes, they needed to make sure that they had their personal protective gear. Then, of course, when things were very bad, every call was a COVID call. They were wearing it all the time. So, you know, we know that from that perspective, from that public health perspective, um, it was certainly challenging. Our, we have a nursing home, we have Mary Knoll um, here, and we were seeing in those congregate housing situations that um, it, they were being hit much harder, and we had to step up. And Open Door Family Medical um, Family Medical Center is here in Austin. They were also um, hard hit right at the beginning, trying to just keep up, whether keeping up with testing, keeping up with PPE. Luckily, you know, the county, and I give a lot of credit to County Executive Latimer, um, who, you know, really just jumped right in right at the very beginning, because Westchester was, you know, really the first community that was um, hit so hard in New York State, um, jumped right in to try to find ways that we could get more testing done, that we could have safe, safer places for people who were sick to be able to separate from, from those who needed treatment for other illnesses besides COVID. And, uh, you know, we really rely on the county. We still are having once a week calls with the county um, to give us guidance um, and to make sure that we as a municipality were doing everything we could to protect our residents and also to work in conjunction with our neighboring uh, communities. Here on Westchester Talk Radio, I'm John Marino. We are WestchesterTalkRadio.com, produced by Shark Creative. That is Shark with a C, not a K, and made possible by our good friends over at Entergy, Indian Point Energy Center. 
supporting our communities through April of 2021. White Plains Hospital, we thank our heroes on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic at White Plains Hospital, Wartburg Healthcare and Rehabilitation in Mount Vernon, Park Sterling Realty in Bronxville, and Michael Labriola Landscape Design and Construction, joined by Dana Levenberg, County Supervisor of Osning. Dana Levenberg, the COVID-19 impact upon money in town, on budgets, on infrastructure, on a capital plan that you might have in town. How serious has that been? So we immediately started, you know, put sort of freeze a freeze in place on any un- unnecessary expenses. Um, we cut back on, you know, overtime hours right at the very beginning of the of the um, pandemic. And um, then as, as things sort of started to ramp back up, um, we ended up having a really um, ch- do play catch up to a certain extent with uh, a lot of the things that were happening. Like, for example, when when all of the teams were shut down and parks were shut down, um, we didn't really need to, you know, put new clay out on our baseball fields. And we anticipated that this was going to be long, longer lasting than it was and that we were going to miss the entire season at the beginning, which I admit was um, maybe not the best uh, in hindsight because we did have to do a lot of scrambling to catch up towards the end of um, the closure as things were ramping up pretty quickly, you know, pretty much in, in four weeks. Um, everything or was it four weeks now? I can't remember or eight weeks, but uh, it was pretty quick that we ramped back up um, according to governor's orders. And so we had to play a little bit of catch up. Uh, but we did have to postpone a number of our projects. And the interesting thing is many of our projects are um, projects that would serve the public at a time of um, where people really need to get outside because so many of our town projects are parks related or, or road roadway related. So we were had finished up a number of things. Uh, we have applied for a lot of grants. We have been told that most of them are still on track to come through. A lot of them are state grants because um, we look to offset the cost to the um, directly to the ta- to the. Um, property taxpayers, but we do um, anticipate that most of those funds are still going to go through. However, this year we weren't able to apply for additional funds, for example, for next year. We are in the middle of our comprehensive plan uh, process, or just at the beginning, I should say, but um, in the middle of starting it. And uh, through that plan, we're able to look sort of broad-based at things like our you know, economy, our environment, and equity all at the same time. And it's kind of perfect timing um, in the middle of this pandemic, just because um, we know that uh, all of these things are critical issues and we're just seeing how they evolve differently now than maybe we had thought they would before. But people are, you know, desperate to get outside still, to go walking, bike, bicycle riding. We've just seen an, an uptick in all of these different forms of people's um, interaction with our town. So it's a great time for us to rethink long-term how we can make our community accessible uh, for everybody and also um, sustainable for our businesses and for our homeowners and for renters, uh, even though we don't have that many in the town right now, um, and really integrate with um, our neighbors, our neighboring communities to make sure all of these things work well together. You've come up with an interesting, unique term for all of this. You call it the green agenda, sustainability meets public health. <laughs> did I come up with that or did you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I mean, I do think um, one uh, one of the initiatives that I worked on with uh, the Metro um, uh, APA, American Planning Association chapter, was looking at planning um, through the lens of public health and how we can think about planning our communities so that they can be um, healthy communities, so that people can have access to healthy food, access to open spaces, walkability, bikeability, um, looking, you know, at uh, complete streets and roadways so that they are um, not just pass-throughs, but uh, that they allow people to engage in community. Um, they're more, you know, making them more accessible for to businesses and making it easier for people to engage with local businesses without always having to get into their single passenger vehicle, for example. 
So um, we have actually made a lot of strides in that direction. We, through grant, grant funding and working with the DEC, we were able to install three electric vehicle charging stations over the last few years. Uh, we integrated electric and um, plug-in hybrid vehicles to our town fleet. And we're hoping to be one of the first communities to have a fully electric bus for our senior nutrition program through some uh, community development block grant funding um, that we get through the county that, that is actually federal funding. Um, so we're hoping that that's um, going to continue our direction to make our community greener, but also healthier for everybody. And, and that also means looking at ways to maintain open spaces, um, but it also means looking for balance and finding ways for planning to allow for um, zoning changes that make uh, walkability and bikeability more um, easier and, and safer for people, and also planning how housing is more attractive to people who maybe don't want to have two, two cars per family. So all of those kind of fit in, puzzle pieces fit in as we're going down the path with our community members and with our um, comprehensive plan steering committee as we work towards um, that goal of coming up with a new comprehensive plan with sustainability elements that incorporates public health um, as a tool. Uh, a toolbox using the, uh, this uh, Planners for Health toolbox that we adopt, uh, adapted through the American Planning Association. Back in the 80s, I was out on the east end of Long Island. I learned a lot then about protecting open space. That's still a big issue out there today, 35, 40 years later. Preservation, you touched upon this, protecting open space is a huge issue in Austin. When I first came to Westchester, even though I knew about this, I saw on day one, back in 1987 with the old Hudson River Sloop Festival, we were broadcasting it at WFAS in White Plains mm -hmm. on my first day. And I know in Austin, right next to Croton there too, where all this generated from back then, protecting mm -hmm. open space and preserving the Hudson River are key issues. Actually, one of the things that as we... We have a wonderful park, Lewis Engel Waterfront Park. It's actually in the village of Ossining, um, so not unincorporated town, but it's part of the bigger town. And um, it's right on the Hudson, and it's right near the Metro North train station. We have a stage there where in the, in the past years we've had wonderful Friday night concert series in the summer. And last year we had food truck Fridays that accompanied the concert series. And, you know, we have hundreds of people come out, hundreds of people come out for our fireworks every year. And we just upgraded our spray, spray park down there. So we have a very, very busy waterfront in the summer. We have picnic areas, people take out kayaks. We have a boat launch. The Austin Boat and Canoe Club is down there. The recently um, redeveloped um, or developed Henry Gordine Park in the village is there. So we have a lot of wonderful uh, public property that's uh, right on the river. And we have been actually working to improve the park even more because it gets so much use. A uh, number of years ago, some students came to the town and said, we really want you to reopen the beach. It used to be, be called the PAL Police Athletic League Beach. Um, and then years ago, it closed. Um, something happened. Unfortunately, we also are bordered by the uh, sewer treatment plant that Westchester County operates. Um, and we're happy that that's happening someplace um, and that our sewer lines all are able to go there and that's good. But what's not good is when there's um, something, you know, stuff gets out into the huts and, and it gets into our waterways and it creates uh, situations. However, I will say that the high school students have been testing the water in conjunction with Riverkeeper and the environmental club and uh, at Austin high school for the, a number of years now. And for the most part, the water is very clean and safe to swim in right at the beach, the naturally occurring beach at Lewis Angle Park. So the kids want us to reopen the beach. And we've looked into it and we know that it's gonna require probably some engineering to make the sand look nice, to keep the invasive species from growing in the sand and actually make it a place, a go-to place. Um, and of course we would also need lifeguards. Um, so we've been looking into that, but as we started looking into that, we were like, well, but we don't think that the bathrooms are really in the right place. And, you know, we could really do better. So we have applied for some grants to try to get a master park plan in place. We haven't been successful yet in getting those grants, but we're still committed to making the, that park the best it can be. As we've been doing this, 
we also have been looking at climate change and how it's going to affect the the shoreline and how uh, rising sea levels are going to affect the beach there and also all the property that's along there, including our parks and including all the privately owned properties as well. So in conjunction with the Village of Osney, we applied to be part of the Climate Adaptive Design Studio, which was um, something that was state funded um, in partnership with Hudson River Estuary Program, um, DEC, and they have worked with the town and village of Austin to design, they came up, came up with, I think, 18 to 20 designs, third year landscape architecture students from Cornell. What would a reinvented uh, Austin look like and how is it going to need to change and evolve over the next 80 years? Um, which includes, by the way, the full flooding of Metro North chain line. So we, you know, what they came up with some very imaginative adaptations for what we could do to welcome the river in and then let it out and still maintain um, our ability to interact with it and have a productive uh, shoreline that can remain sustainable. So that's something that we've been looking at and also are planning to incorporate in our comprehensive plan, as is the village, and also to see if we can blow out some of those design ideas that the that the students came up with um, and start looking at how or you know where we need to engineer, where we may, may need to relocate, and how we can think about this um, really, you know, with a lot of foresight into the future so that we don't spend a lot of money now um, on things that are going to just get washed away. I guess we can say that the students at Ossining High School have a lot of pride in their school <laughs> and their community, right? Of uh, course, the Ossining pride. pride Best Girls Basketball Team in New York State under Dan Rickey, a member of Westchester Sports Hall of Fame. I must point out I had the honor of inducting Dan into the Hall of Fame a few years back as the Master of Ceremonies for the Hall of Fame. It was quite a night, quite an event where the love and appreciation for Dan Rickey is something you see not only across Ossining, but throughout Westchester and our entire region. And I am partial to the beaches and everything you spoke about in Ossining. I've hosted events along the shoreline in Ossining, enjoyed the beaches, enjoyed the boat clubs there, enjoyed walking along the piers and the waterway. And that Metro North thing runs all the way up and down the Hudson River sure from Yonkers all the way into Putnam County and beyond. And you always have to keep that in mind, you no know, matter what you do, all the way up to all wherever it runs up to in Putnam <laughs> County, Dutchess County, actually, right. that you have to keep that in mind with everything you do along the river. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Yes. And, and, and Kingston actually was part of the CAD um, studio prior to Austin, I think Havistraw or Piermont, I can't remember, one of the, one of the uh, communities across the river as well, because it affects us on both sides of the river. So we do have to take all of these um, uh, chain, chain environmental changes into account as we plan so that we can ensure that we have long-term sustainability of our, of our projects, of our parks, of our public spaces, of our private spaces, of our businesses, you know, everything that's down there. I mean, you know, Katrina um, really had a, you know, a very severe impact on our waterfront. Um, our, I know the, the Austin Boathouse had to close down for a long time. Westerly Marina, um, they, a lot of them were inundated. The, the Boat and Canoe Club was flooded. Um, and, you know, many of them were able to bounce back. Um, but, you know, as they do, they have to think, okay, well, am I just going to rebuild the same way and just take my chances again? Well, yes, maybe it was a hundred year flood, but the hundred year flood seems to be coming like every couple of years. So maybe, you know, we have to rethink and move things up onto stilts. And there, you know, there are FEMA programs. Um, I think that we, with uh, the village just put in uh, a letter of intent to apply for some of that FEMA money to see if we can get some grant money to help us with that next phase of designing what that the waterfront could look like. And we also, by the way, have the Sing Sing Prison Museum, um, which has been a partner and an interest of mine since I worked for Assemblywoman Galef's office because it was a, a big interest of hers um, that's planning to go into the old powerhouse in, in a number of years. And that's also, uh, again, another area of concern. And obviously we have, you know, Sing Sing Correctional Facility there as well. Um, all of these things we need to think about holistically um, in terms of how the environment impacts them, how they impact the community economically, and, um, you know, everything in between. All aboard the Hudson Line to Poughkeepsie, you pass right through Washington along the way. Now, schools have reopened. 
Ossining High School, all the smaller schools, the grammar schools, the middle schools in town, et cetera. How has that gone so far a couple of weeks in? What does this look like from an educational standpoint? Is it mostly virtual? Is it a mix? Is it a hybrid? Yes. I think it's it's a it's the, it's a hybrid, and um, you know families were asked to elect early on what they were going to do if they planned to do a hybrid or if they wanted to just have um, you know virtual learning for their child for their child or their children. And uh, I think that you know they've been doing an incredible job just trying to keep up. But one of the biggest issues that we know is uh, for for our schools and um, Austin is considered one of the harmed suburban five is that um, Austin is really owed foundation aid for many years back now because um, they have not really uh, ever received since for many years now, the foundation aid that they were promised. Um, and that's um, negatively impacts schools, especially schools like Austin where they've seen growing enrollments for many years. Um, so their um, call to the federal government to please Um, make sure that the next uh, CARES Act includes the funding that the state needs so that the state doesn't pull its funding from the schools is critically important. And we know that, um, you know, they've they've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, not only in planning, but in personal protective equipment and in making sure that every child has a computer. And um, we're still working on making sure that everybody can get um, access, Wi-Fi access. And, you know, these things are challenging for our community that has um, is a, an absolutely diverse community, economically diverse, as well as um, ethnically diverse. Um, but mostly from the economic perspective, you know, for people who don't, who can't necessarily afford the Wi-Fi connection, um, or have multiple, m- multiple people at home who are working from home, or can't have somebody at home to make sure that their child is um, getting the help that they need with virtual learning. These are all um, extremely important and challenging issues for our school district here in Austin. In this era of social justice and police reform, and I ask pretty much any public official I speak to around Westchester, I pretty much bring this question up because it is something that everybody has to deal with. The governor has issued a mandate, his guidance, that by April of 2021, he's going to have on his desk Police reform in every community around the state. What policing looks like? Do you need to make changes? If so, how should this be done? In the town of Austin, what does this look like at the moment, six months before it needs to be on the governor's desk, knowing that changes may occur along the way? Sure. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we don't actually have a police force in town of Austin. We uh, contract with the Austin police in the village of Austin. Um, So the village of Austin is going through the process right now um, and has established a working committee um, to um, of um, interested community members specifically to help engage the community in the um, ultimate product that will be that um, police reform and reinvention um, guidance document. Um, and there they we've asked from the town perspective to please be included in that. Um, we also formed um, back in, I guess, in the late fall and winter of uh, 2019, we formed a community equity task force. And that was in response to some um, hate symbols that had appeared in Austin, um, actually at Engel Park, right at the waterfront, and also in some of in our schools that we were concerned about. And we really wanted to make sure that, um, and, and also the NAACP had kind of come to the village and to the town and basically said, we really don't think, you know, you kind of stepped up and step and talked about these issues in a way that we believe need to be discussed, these, um, you know, hate symbols. So we think, you know, you need to do something. And we immediately um, sort of um, started thinking, what is it that we can do? And how can we um, address institutional racism, um, as well as address, um, you know, issues of hate symbols, we um, engaged our, um, the, our, um, the EAP, which I'm forgetting now what it stands for through the county, um, to do some some um, implicit bias trainings for our entire staff in the town. And we also um, brought stakeholders together to form a task force to originally address some of these, um, you know, reactions and um, 
strong feelings, obviously, to these hate symbols that were appearing in our town. We work so hard in Austin because we know we have a diverse community of Black, Latinx, um, and people from all different countries who come to Austin. I think um, one of our previous superintendents counted that we had I think 52 different countries represented here in Austin. And she used to call it the United Nations of Austin. Um, Almost and- as many as Queens. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so we, um, we, we put together a community equity task force. And what happened is, of course, during COVID, we, you know, got, we had a pivot and we refocused. And then when um, the tragedy with George Floyd took place, we also had to come together again. So we had um, a, a small group in place, which quickly expanded to many people. I think we have at least 20 people now who are part of our equity task force. And we also um, asked the village to please include representation from our, our leadership, from our equity task force to be part of their uh, reform and reinvention, uh, police reform and reinvention um, committee, which is is happening. So right now, I think the village is looking for a facilitator to help with uh, community engagement and help with police engagement and to make sure that um, policies make sense. But I will say that, uh, you know, Austin Police, our chief has been um, very proactive in terms of um, many of the uh, agenda items that are included in uh, the reform agenda that um, and the changes that are, are looking to be made already and um, really looks at community policing as um, the way to go and, and tries to do everything he can to be proactive um, and um, in touch with the community and establishing trust with the community. I don't think that we're there yet. I think we have some issues that we really still have to address, especially with our Latinx community. Uh, but I think by working together, um, in a collaborative uh, way, I think we, we can certainly get there. As we head towards the end of 2020, 2021 will bring change in the village of Austin. Mayor Victoria Garrity is stepping down, and I know she's been a huge part of the community around all of Austin, not just the village. How do you adjust when a new mayor comes in from your standpoint, from Having the new mayor learn the ropes of Austin, basically, and then proceeding with everything you want to and need to proceed with. Okay, well, the good news is that we, I don't think that the um, one person who's running for mayor has a challenger. Um, Rika Levin is running for um, the mayoral seat. And she's currently the deputy mayor. So uh, the good news is there's not a huge, huge learning curve because she's been in local government uh, for a number of years. I think I'm trying to remember if I I think that we might have even run together one year because she was running for in an off year for uh, the, uh, you know, one year opening in in one of the seats. So I think we actually did um, go door to door together a few times. And I know that she's been um, on board with certainly um, very much. in, in, on board with a lot of the environmental issues that I've been focused on. Um, and I know that she's also comes from a, a business background and she, she works for a not-for-profit. Um, so she has a lot of varied experiences in marketing. Uh, and, and I think that she's going to offer um, a, a very easy transition for the village of Ossining. And a lot of the people who are coming on board as vill- new village trustees are also um, people who have. Um, you know, they, they know their way around the village as well, including um, Dana White, who has been the village historian for a number of years. And she's even been doing some work for the town. Um, before she gets, uh, becomes a uh, trustee, she's been doing some work for the town, helping us with archiving. And it's a great job for a historian as herself, because now she's getting the full, um, the full up, deep dive into all the town documents as we try to clean up our um, records and manage them a little bit better. So after everything that's occurred in 2020, I guess we could say the easier the transition, the better, and this is the way it likely will be. A hundred percent. I think that it's going to be a very easy transition. Rika is very well informed about all of the initiatives that are in place in the village. And I'm having lunch with her today. So I'm hopeful that uh, we can continue to have a very good, um, proactive working relationship. And um, the same as I've had with, uh, with Mayor Garrity. 
all the best in the rest of 2020 and into 2021. I know it's been a challenging year, but in Austin, you have certainly weathered the storm and will continue to do so. We know that. Joined by Dana Levenberg, we thank you, the supervisor of the town of Austin. Dana, thank you for being part of the Cup of Joe political show here on Westchester Talk Radio. Hope we get to do it again. John, thank you so much. I very much appreciate it. And regards to Mayor Garrity, again, wish her all the best for us in her future endeavors. Thank you. Shall do. Here on Westchester Talk Radio, westchestertalkradio.com. I'm John Marino. Cup of Joe political show produced by Shark with a C, not a K, Shark Creative, and made possible by our good friends at places like Entergy, Indian Point Energy Center, supporting our communities right through April of 2021. Lipolis Electric, don't be left in the dark. Get Lipolis, Hightower, Westchester, and Hightower, they manage our wealth to a fiduciary standard. Special thank you to all of our heroes at White Plains Hospital for all they've done throughout the COVID-19 pandemic here in 2020. Wartburg Healthcare and Rehabilitation in Mount Vernon, Park Sterling Realty in Bronxville, and Michael Labriola Landscape Design and Construction. We thank you one and all. Catch all of our Westchester, Putnam, Duchess, and Fairfield County talk radio programming on our YouTube channel, Shark Creative YouTube. 